Welcome everyone to Web Sleuths YouTube Live. My name is Tricia Griffith and I am the very proud owner of WebSleuths.com. Best true crime discussion forum in the universe if you ask me and I believe you just did. Okay, tonight I am so excited to bring out a woman I admire greatly. I mean, she gets done, she, she does more in one hour than I do in a year. Uh, everybody, we've had her on before. Let's welcome back Dr. Laura Petler. Dr. Petler, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My pleasure and honor to be here with you. And and I, I certainly admire your work and thank you for what you do for victims oh. and for for justice and and uh, answers for families and trying to help bring everybody to, together into your forum. It's been a tremendous addition to the criminal justice system and to our process. So you know, wow. we applaud you from LPA. Thank you very much, Tricia. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the hardworking moderators and fabulous members, thank you very, very much. That means a, a lot to us, trust me. But I, I want to give everybody an idea of, of who you are because it is truly amazing. And this is from uh, drlaurapetler.com. You are the renowned forensic criminologist. You're a crime scene reconstruction system expert. You're an inventor, a licensed private investigator, and you own and operate uh, Laura Petler and Associates. And, and tell us about that. And then we're going to jump into the Brian Laundry case. And then we're going to talk about this amazing new uh, system that you have developed. It's just fascinating. But Tell us exactly what your business is, at Laura Petler and Associates. So Laura Petler and Associates is, a, is primarily a death investigation firm where we use a method called the murder room that is a scientific, systematic, both quantitative and qualitative uh, methodology for investigating manner of death primarily, but it, it also evolves into identifying elements of staging and and normal cases where you know not every murder is staged some murders are just the way they are and then it also like taking the manners of death and if, if we have cases that, that that we have lots of cases that come in that are not homicide or murder mm -hmm. cases where they are suicides accidents and other types of death investigations where there's a civil process going on or some type of a legal action may not always be criminal and so we're involved there we work from a round table perspective where there is no boss or head of the table so just because my name is on the door doesn't make me any more important than any other expert here at lpa we are all lateral and we are all equal and we sit at this round table from courtroom or from crime scene to courtroom mm -hmm. and it starts with you know literally where the investigation starts at the crime scene with the 911 call and then all the way through the process through death investigators and dna experts and forensic crim and anthropologists and even odontology which we'll be talking about tonight and then through um digital forensics and all these other types of experts and crime scene experts we get all the way over to prosecution around the other end of the table so <clears throat> crime scene and prosecution actually sit beside each other because then all those experts are in, in between, mm -hmm. you know, crime scene to courtroom. And the murder room is is a walls of information. And so when we, what we have found is that when you put this information from a case file onto the walls in these specific matrices that, that we've developed at LPA, it leads to what we are very proud of, of a 98% solve rate with wow. this particular method. So um, I teach it all over the world. It's been mm -hmm. adopted by many agencies throughout the world, which we're very grateful because we believe it, it does increase their likelihood of, of cases being solved and decreases the likelihood of cases going cold. It also resolves manner of death where there's a question of suspicious death and mm -hmm. it ends up to be a suicide or an accident or something else. Right. And I would imagine that you see a lot of, and I'm going to take a guess here, a lot of families with suicide victims who say this wasn't a suicide. He, he or she would never kill themselves. Yes. And when you take that and you go through your process and you're able to either confirm the family suspicions or 
show them here is the process. And yes, unfortunately, your loved one did kill themselves. You know, we, we are. And then there's other cases where we can't conclusively render such a, a, a conclusive opinion, such mm -hmm. a firm opinion. And we end up going with undetermined in those cases and recommend that it stays undetermined. The reason is because when you take the the study of suicidology mm -hmm. and you start to look at the experts who are are uh, specifically dedicated in their specific areas to studying suicidology, mm -hmm. there's a lot of myth surrounding suicide where people think it can always be the result of depression. Right. But they've actually studied, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of suicide attempts by survivors. They've found a mix of empirical data, which is published, you know, under that broad heading of suicidology, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. it dispels some of the myths in suicide where you can always come to an answer. A lot of times families will come here and say there were no signs of suicide. You know, they, there was just no... Right. warning sign but there were actually warning signs mm -hmm. do, do those warning signs lead to a long-term suicide ideation no not in a lot mm -hmm. of cases sometimes suicide can be very secretive so if you have a person who's a very private person to begin with a very secretive person to begin with a person who does not talk about their emotions a person who doesn't talk about the way they feel about things and then they commit suicide in 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 private that's a reflection of their personality to begin right. with right they're not going to share their suicide ideology with you ideation mm -hmm. with you as a as a friend or a loved one they deal with everything in life in private they're also going to deal with their death in private Right, exactly. A lot of times I think it's, you know, for families, they're not understanding that um, suicide can be a reflective element of the personality of the victim. Um, so sometimes, you know, we say we're not going to presume that this person was suffering for, from some psychic or some burden or uh, the thought of death, but at the same time, you know, we have indicators that it's consistent with suicide and other indicators that may not indicate suicide. So for us, we're going to go on the safe side, err on the side of ethical practice and rule it undetermined. Understand, totally understand that. And I imagine that's a pretty emotional thing for you and your team yes, to go it through. Is. Every Let's day. Yeah, I can imagine. Let's talk about Brian Laundrie. Uh, sure. he was, his body was found. They said it was bones, uh, but it was determined to be a suicide. Now, if we don't have a note and we don't know, maybe that's how they determined it was a suicide. They Maybe they had a note that we don't know about. We do know that um, uh, at least a portion of his skull was uh, recovered uh, and there was a gun. How in the world, let's just say hypothetically, they didn't have a note. How in the world could anthropologists determine that this was a suicide? They would have to have a portion of the skull where the bullet hole was in, I would take it. Um, how would you determine that to be a suicide and not a murder? So I think that we should probably talk about a couple of things before we answer the question outright. How do okay. you determine manner of death and, and choose suicide versus homicide? Um, a couple things specific to this case, but then also generalities when it comes to submerged or, or immersed bodies in water. Mm -hmm. um, the, the situation with Brian Laundry is that he is, I don't know if he's native to that area, but he was living in that area with his parents yes. at the time. And this was an area allegedly that he had frequented at some point. Correct. Maybe it was a point place where he camped or something. So it was a familiar area. <clears throat> That's always, you know, it's common that, that mm -hmm. people are both, not only do they die of suicide in familiar areas, but they also are killed, you know, places where you run all the time or where you, right. walk, you know, something like that. So, um, 
when you're talking about a, a, a medical examiner or you're talking about a, an investigator or somebody like that who's trying to come to an arrival at a specific manner of death, choosing one manner of death over the other four, mm -hmm. because you have five, you know, you have homicide, suicide, accident, natural, and undetermined. Right. Well, we know it's not natural because he's got a piece of, you know, he's got clearly some type of a, of a defect in, in a wound track through some type of bone. Correct. So we know that it's not natural. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's no indication at all that it's accidental. Right. There's no indication at all that it's homicide. Mm -hmm. So they go toward suicide or undetermined in some of these cases because that's where they they fall right um sometimes suicide i think in rulings of suicide it can be actually due to a lack of facts okay. versus an abundance of facts mm -hmm. where there is because you don't know it's got to be a suicide right right gotcha and so yeah. that's the only thing left that it makes any sense right yeah it could be okay. so then so then there's there's several other elements coming into play here. Mm -hmm. This is one of those worst case scenarios for a medical examiner to have to be a forensic pathologist, which is a, is a sub discipline discipline of forensic medicine. Okay. Along with forensic odontology, along mm -hmm. with forensic anthropology. So in these cases, as it was released in the media by the press release, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm going just straight off the press release. Right. They indicated that they did recover skeletal remains through the medical examiner's process of crime scene or death scene processing. That was specific to me and it resonated with me because it's not a crime scene person that's out there processing. It's the medical examiner's team that's processing. So that could involve taking the area of uh, bone distribution where they find mm -hmm. the majority of, you know, the bones and they cordon that off, Tricia, they, they block it into 12 by 12 inch, like they grid it per mm -hmm. se. So then they take the, they excavate like, just like an archeological, ar archeological site where they might be like looking for bones of dinosaurs or something like that. Some okay. type of artifacts like at Vesuvius or something. So they they go in and they they in each of these little squares of, of you know 12 inches by 12 inches, they take all of that dirt and material out and they do a process. They have these big sifters, they're really right. large. The ones that we used to have are really large. And I and it's been quite a while since I've had a buried body. I haven't had a buried body or a submerged body or something involved with sediment in quite a while. Mm -hmm. But needless to say bones are can be embedded in the ground a bit especially okay. when you have water involved in this case so they're going to sift through all these things and then sift it down like it's the sifters will have bigger holes and smaller 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 holes go all the way down until they get all the evidence like bagged the way that they want to be able to transport then when they transport it they're going to process it all different ways so they, mm -hmm. they excavate these sites much like an archaeological site. Okay. Then once they once they do that, they're going to then ask for what they refer to as consultations from anthropology and odontology. Very normal in these cases. They have mm -hmm. to make identification. Uh, and in the skull, you can get, and I'm not a DNA expert. As you know, I'm a forensic criminologist. I'm not an anthropologist. I'm not an odontologist, not a pathologist. <laughs> but, but practically as a, everything else though. <laughs> but, but I know some about all of those, you know, right. just in general, because I, I have to know them. I have to know it enough, Trisha, to be able to make the phone calls to those experts at our yes. round table when we have something of this nature, of course. I wouldn't be rendering opinions on bones, of course, or mm -hmm. dentition or any kind of tooth related mark either. Right. So, so like from the forensic medicine standpoint, the forensic pathologist was, was very clear in what they said in the bulleted points in the press release, they process the Emmys process, the scene number two, the Emmys recovered skeletal remains. Number three, 
they they ask for a forensic anthropology consult they ask mm -hmm. for a forensic odontology consult and then the body the the skeletal remains were identified conclusively not only by dentition by the teeth but also through dna which means right. they could have gotten the like tooth pulp um contains dna the occipital bone also contains dna in cases of this nature i've done uh i've been involved in we have done searches for dna in in various locations of bones like that okay. uh like they can take dna from mm -hmm. so in this case again we're not dealing with an embalmed body embalmed bodies it's very difficult to get dna either from tooth pulp or from the occipital bone we don't have that case here and so they're looking for the anthropologists are going to say you know what age is this skeleton is the skeleton male or female what mm -hmm. race is the skeleton uh, and all of these different elements and then how long has the skeleton been exposed to elements or mm -hmm. the 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 what we call post-mortem interval mm -hmm. the issue trisha with with this and this is what i want all of your listeners and all of all of you to know there are so many moving parts when it comes to deciding how they came to the arrival mm -hmm. at the manner of death suicide versus undetermined or homicide right mm -hmm. how did they get and that's the original question that's what we're talking about here when you take into consideration the fact that if Brian Laundrie shot himself and he's got a self-inflicted gun gunshot wound to the head there, you know, like I, it, it's aggravating when people say, oh, well, you know, you, it's a gunshot to the back of the head. You can, you know, it's gotta be homicide. No, you turn your head sideways, just like this. You put the gun to the back of your head you can shoot yourself in the back of the head easily. Right. Right. Exactly. You know, so it, it doesn't, it doesn't exactly work that way. So like, um, they're they're dealing with did 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 say suicide let's go with suicide first so suicide brian laundry shoots himself does he do it on dry land where then the body is now on dry land it's before the the area filled with water so there there are several parts of the post-mortem interval already taking place while the body is on land then you in this particular location there is an abundance of animal predation mm -hmm. so you and specifically in this area wild hogs oh wow that's right and those and those things are, are beastly eat, they're horrible and they yeah. eat bones uh, a lot yeah yes so could that be a reason why there is not a full skeletal recovery mm -hmm. you know it could be alligators it could be snakes and all of these things could have occurred well it, it really could have occurred prior to the body being submerged in water mm, right and then the body becomes submerged in water mm -hmm. so then you have all this additional insect infestation you have all of the chemical uh chemistry of the water itself and it being an anaerobic environment therefore did it decrease or did all of those variables the temperature of the water the humidity the the chemistry makeup of the water the current the obstacles the the animals predatory fish you know a shark i mean all these different things are all parts of what a forensic anthropologist would have to take into consideration when determining manner of death okay and that's so they did that with brian i i'm just saying generally speaking forensic anthropology would take all of those variables and i mean that's a laundry list you know that's no pun intended, taking, right. taking variables moving parts in into one determination of manner of death so i could they have gone undetermined they, they could have but they have this defect in the skull mm -hmm. so then they're, they're looking at the defect we don't know if it's a penetrating or perforating wound at least i've not seen anything about that no, there you know, hasn't is there a, right yeah like is there an entry and an exit or is this mm -hmm. one where they just didn't recover the bullet is the mandible missing from the skull where just the top teeth and the cranial fossa in the skull are found as opposed to this this part of the the skull um you know there's all those variables but they've got enough to know that there's some kind of wound path mm -hmm through the head right and when they examine the bones they can examine it for soot or 
some type of, of burn mark into the bone itself because when the skin when the gunshot if say it's a contact like hard contact like pressing the firearm into your head or even like close range where it's just like that far or like this you know a lot mm -hmm. of people sit there right. like this or something or this you know any which way you'd want to do it the skin when the gases come out of the fire the barrel of the firearm go in under the skin it's going to blow that skin out so all that stuff is going to be embedded somehow in the head how much of that is left on bones post gunshot wound to the head when you take into consideration the a potential post-mortem interval that was already taking place on dry land and then it was either exacerbated or reduced and, and stagnated by by the elements of um the water and the rushing of that water being right. carried from one place to another hitting all those obstacles and all those bones being damaged and stuff like they had enough to be able to consistently say the manner of death when compared to all five manners of death was mm -hmm. most consistent with suicide uh, over than any other manner of death so you know but it's definitely important to recognize the 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 very high bar they're up against to get to that so right. do they have additional evidence that supports that in context beyond the quantitative evidence absolutely yeah there's there's a real good chance that maybe there was a note or or something along those lines and dr petler when i'm looking down here i'm not ignoring you i'm looking to see if anybody has questions oh no problem. everybody always gets mad at me they're like you're looking at your phone when you have a guest um, oh no i'm not i was like in my zone trisha i wasn't even looking. <laughs> well, I was was, sitting here, i'm sitting here talking to my in my own head you know yeah, talk, was, like thinking about what i'm gonna say so no it's okay <laughs> it was great it was great uh kathy wright wants to know do all bones have dna can you extract I DNA don't know that I, I don't know that for sure um mm -hmm. I'm not a DNA expert so and I'm not an anthropologist I I don't know the answer to that I, we know teeth and I didn't yeah. know that that the the bone, yeah, yeah we had a case that was an embalmed head found in the woods and we Ew. yes Wait, an embalmed head embalmed how what you got okay you can't leave us hanging you got no, to talk a little won't. bit about that. How did it get there? That's a very good question. <laughs> so were you able to determine anything about it? Or? Uh, we did diatome testing. We did a lot of isotope testing with the hair that was still on the head. Uh, and we were able to ice uh, the isotopes tell you the isotope technology explains what a person was eating and what kind of water they were drinking prior to mm. death because it's it's recorded in the hair okay and so we were able to send <clears throat> the the dental we, we sent the entire head off for um forensic anthro and forensic odontology they were able I have, to tell it i have a question and this is just really a weird one and this is i have okay. to own it how in the hell do you send a head do you send it through the u.s mail do you deliver it yourself? Um, in this case, you, it was that extra delivered. packet. I mean, what do you do? Yes, it's the it was hand delivered in this case. Okay, so yeah. I, I'm just thinking, my gosh, that'd be a lot of paperwork. And how would you explain it? Very odd. I don't think that. And they do ship things like this, but the, in this particular case, it was a rather localized. It happened to be localized to that particular area mm -hmm. where they were sending it off to those experts, so they were able to take it. So somebody found it and call yes. the police and then yes that, boy that's an odd thing can you imagine oh, like it, it would be a good one for your forum oh i would i would love to get into that i'll send you some links to it so you can would you please that. absolutely oh, dr peller i would love that okay sure um, i want to get into uh the the information that you sent me and let me grab this here um you sent me this incredible article about what you're doing and it's uh, the title of the article. And I'm going to put all of these links in the description, everyone. Uh, classifying staging behavior in homicide cases. An, investi an investigatory, is it taxonomy? Taxonomy, yes. Taxonomy. Okay. And this is something. 
that you have created. And my friends, when you hear this, this is just going to be amazing. And I'll put this link up to this whole uh, article as well. But Dr. Petler, tell us about this. This sounds like game changing to me. Thank you, Trisha. I, I certainly appreciate your support and, and thank you for reading it. <clears throat> I, I hope that your um, your viewers and your listeners will, will take an opportunity to read the article because it is groundbreaking in our sub-discipline of forensic criminology, specifically in the study of staged homicide cases. Mm -hmm. And we are very, very excited to have finally been able to, to publish it this year internationally. So first, I think it's important to identify what and, and, just, and define what is a taxonomy? You hear this word, you know, what is a taxonomy? People use it in, in biology, for example, to classify organisms. So commonly, it may be um, more of a biological term in, in some arenas than it is mm -hmm. in, ta in, in forensic crimp. However, a taxonomy is merely a hierarchical order that you, you, you arrange variables in a hierarchical order. So for example, when we go to school, we have 12 grades and you have to go to first grade, then you go to second, then you go to third, you go to right. fourth. You don't go from first grade to eighth grade. Mm -hmm. You go from first to second. And so a taxonomy builds on itself. Okay. So, so just like the murder room, Trisha, and you and you know this from our other conversations, the murder room is a six stage investigatory process and you have to do everything in stage one before you can do stage two, because everything you're going to do in stage two pulls from stage one. Right. And vice versa. So when you're going to stage three, everything you're going to do in stage three has ha has to be uh, grounded in stages one and two. So the taxonomy in this particular case, the Petler's staging taxonomy is what it's what it's called. We published it. Uh, I've, I don't actually know the date, Tricia. It's on that article whenever whenever it published. And what it is is we've taken all the behaviors that we've identified over the past more than a decade since I've been focused in staged behaviors, as you're aware. I wrote the third dissertation in the world on staged behavior, behavior, and then wrote the first book in the world on staged behavior. Please tell staged us what staged behavior is. Staging Please. behavior, staging behavior is the uh, deliberate, purposeful manipulation or tampering with death scene evidence prior to the arrival of law enforcement for the purpose of misdirecting a criminal invest or potentially criminal investigation to some other legitimate manner of death, like suicide or accident yeah, or missing okay. person or something to else. Change the crime scene, basically. Okay. The, the alteration, we, we talk about staging behavior versus alteration. And death scene alteration is when, for example, you have an autoerotic death where the victim is into autoerotica and accidentally dies. And as you know, in, in autoerotic cases, uh, a lot of people that practice autoerotica, uh, they deprive themselves of oxygen to increase blood flow to different areas of the body to increase sensation mm -hmm. and create, create uh, enhanced arousal and sexual satisfaction. That's the whole point. Well, sometimes when they deprive themselves of oxygen or they're doing this like incomplete strangulation or kind of like hanging themselves, you know, to cut off oxygen to get this euphoric feeling, they accidentally die. Right. And they don't mean to die in that very, what would be perceived by some as potentially embarrassing to the dignity of that person. Mm -hmm. So we have some loved ones when they come in and they find this autoerotic victim in a, what they perceive would somebody would be judgmental or something. A lot of times loved ones will change that scene and we call that death scene alteration. They're not changing the scene to misdirect law enforcement, they're trying to protect the victim. Okay. So death scene alteration is for the purpose of protecting the victim, as opposed to staging behavior, which is specifically dying, designed to protect the offender. Got it. From okay. being caught. Two totally different things. So yes, is it changed the scene? Yes, but staging behavior protects the offender. Death scene alteration protects the victim. 
Okay. And so this uh, new creation that, that you have put together, uh, yes. keep explaining. So you, you take it and... So so I interrupted your, your description. I apologize. So that's okay. We so we've like we've identified a tremendous number of staging behaviors. So when you look at the article and, and when your viewers and when your listeners then they see it, they'll see that we have moved away from what everybody commonly refers to as what's called crime scene staging. Mm -hmm. What we've discovered in our research over the past decade is that staging behavior is not limited to the crime scene mm -hmm. staging behavior can be identified and classified as one uh, as a behavior that you can put under one of three categories linguistic cluster is the first cluster and under that cluster as you see there in the diagram you've got everything from written notes to written letters, to bank documents, to receipts, mm -hmm. to digital text messages, emails, and then you have the verbal. So linguistic can be written or oral or right. verbal. You know, so you've got all of those things. Then the second cluster of behaviors is visual. So from the death scene alteration, do they alter the death scene? Sure, they do mm -hmm. alter the death scene, but they don't stop there a lot of times. When right. we talk about the Jody Arias case, the Jody Arias uh, behavioral pattern of stage behavior is the very, very best case to learn the taxonomy and to, and to practice it, to put it into good use. Because there are only two things that Jody Arias didn't do that we're, and we don't know, she might have, we don't know for sure. But when you look at that visual cluster, cl the visual cluster is divided into three sub clusters which is addition, subtraction, and destruction. Okay. Some stagers, they add things to the crime scene. They bring evidence in to mislead and, and misdirect the investigation. Some stagers to subtract from the crime scene. They clean up. They remove evidence. They conceal mm -hmm. evidence. They do whatever they're going to do with it. They hide it somehow. Then there are, is the third subcluster called destruction. And destruction is typically breaking something breaking a computer hard drive or something like that something physical or break uh i'm sorry destroying evidence with water or fire mm -hmm. okay. the third cluster in the taxonomy of of uh staging behavior is gestural meaning that you have some some behaviors like in like everybody is going to remember when jody arias did that handstand headstand when she was in the interview room, oh, I know yeah. you're shaking your head. I am too. I can't. I just can't. I know. I can't even head. right now. I know. It's like the thought of it is like, okay. But yeah. see, the psychology of that is so important. Another thing that's important about the, and you can use this with the gestural, is Jody Arias at one point, the investigators left the room and Jody Arias put her head down on, on the table and acted like she was sleeping when she heard them come back in because she wanted to to give the impression that she just didn't care that mm -hmm. this was so insignificant to her that she could just sleep through it right she wasn't even sleeping but that was a behavioral gesture that wasn't a staged behavior in the scene that was away way away from the scene right right exactly. that's a gestural behavior she's adding the element of sleep to her mm -hmm. gestures to misdirect the investigation and to right. make and she's staging that she's asleep. She's not asleep. Right. And that is something significant that you've determined that absolutely investigators should look at. And girl look behavioral right. evidence is, is tremendous. So not only are they manipulating these scenes on us, mm -hmm. they're also, look at Jody Arias again, go back to linguistic. She posted on her MySpace that she missed Travis so much. She sent him emails. She left voicemails for him. There were all kinds of things that she did. She wrote him a letter. She knew he was dead, but she was staging like he was still alive. That is right. all linguistic based staging evidence that had nothing to do with the scene. Exactly. And you know what? So who would have who would have thought about putting all of that together to make it easier to to come up with uh, right. what actually happened? So exactly. when you 
when you create this, then what do you do? Do you go out and train law enforcement agencies or do yes. they come to you or how does this work? Um, we, we're not that far in the process. We, we mm -hmm. do intend to teach it. We'll have a new class on it at some point. I, I haven't taught it yet, except like talking to people like this, uh, like yourself about it in these types of forums. I have presented it internationally. Um, I taught it in India earlier this year and I oh, can't, wow. re I think I taught it in also in Italy. And when, when I teach in those international uh, forums like that, there's typically multiple countries that are joined in there. Mm -hmm. So it, we've, we've reached quite a few countries with this so mm -hmm. far. And, and it's just a, it's an amazing thing because we've turned a taxonomy that you're seeing in that, in that document there into a checklist. That's mm -hmm. a workable checklist. That's part of now LPA standard chapter five in our reports that go out to our investing to our law enforcement agencies or our clients for other things. So we're categorizing stage. First of all, we're getting away from crime scene staging and calling it yeah. staging. That's the first thing. Staging period. Yep. Staging behavior, staging pattern, staging, whatever you want to call it. But mm -hmm. we going like calling it crime scene staging is narrowing and putting blinders on your face like this. Right. Open it up your mind, you know, open up your mind to, to seeing it in three clusters Mm -hmm. linguistic visual and gestural you'll get a lot farther with your cases exactly oh that sounds wonderful and again everybody i'm going to put the link up in the description and uh, i'll tweet it out so you, you've got to thank read this you so article much because it is you. fascinating okay. i really appreciate that we don't have a lot of time because I, I promised you i wouldn't keep you any later than 45 minutes <laughs> thank but, you um there are several people with this question in chat and it's my question as well and i think i've asked you this before but okay. we want to hear it again Give us your most intriguing case. Oh my goodness. Or one of them. Maybe you can't pick just one, but so um we, you know, we're we're getting ready in 2022 to launch the Murder Room podcast, as as you're aware. Right. And uh the Murder Room podcast season one is the reinvestigation of Betty Newmar, our alleged serial killers, six dead men in her life, five dead husbands and one dead son. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you now, after not only investigating this case and solving it in 2007 and arresting her in 2008 and putting her in jail for solicitation to commit murder of her fourth husband, Harold Gentry, I have since determined that the, the methodology and everything that we've used to explore the and reopen the case in 21 uh, has, this has become the most, most intriguing case to me going back to a lot of those crime scenes um 50 plus years later you would be shocked to know the same way i was shocked while i was there that even standing there at a crime scene 50 plus years after the victim died right where we are standing we got a tip in the case that came in right there as we were standing there. Wow. So we're excited to share that information with, with our, our new listeners of the new murder room podcast upcoming in 2022. So I have to, at this point, you know, I would, uh, that really is, has been the most intriguing because I've had that case for 14 years and it's been open for me for that long. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, just in case uh, you thought that, Dr. Laura Petler didn't have enough to do. Uh, you are also a uh, musician. You write, yes. and you sing, yes. and you create yes. the music for the podcast, right? Yes, yes. And so I, I write. Um, I've written all the music for the podcast. So it's got all. It, it's got a complete original soundtrack wow. that's going with it. And um, we're very excited about that because that's something very different in the in the true crime space. There mm -hmm. are very many, if any, crossovers like myself, you know, professional musician. I was on tour. I've had several albums and everything retired from professional music and then came out of retirement to specifically write this soundtrack. I've been very um, fortunate to partner with incredible sound engineers and composers and an incredible team of musicians. And collaboratively, we have come up with just really good music that um, remembers victims and and really gives a lot of a, a feel to 
to the podcast and and i'm looking forward to sharing all of that with you oh we can't wait well when it gets closer to the time that, uh, that your podcast debuts will you please come back absolutely and, it would be my honor to my pleasure just uh just talk about it and put the link out everywhere because i'm really looking forward to it dr thank pepper you. thank you so much You're um, very welcome thank you for having me trisha i know I appreciate the opportunity Holidays are stressful. I, I hope you have a, a nice, peaceful one. And uh, we do. <laughs> take care and we care. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Give my best to your family and kiss your horses for me. I will. Thank okay. you all. Thank you. Bye bye now. Bye. There we go. I promised, I promised I wouldn't keep her any longer. She wanted to go 30 and 45. And so we. We agreed to 45. So, uh, da, 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 da. anyway, um, okay. You know, while she, while she was talking about, um, uh, auto erotic asphyxiation, I started to get hot and I was going to take this off. And I thought, no, that would look really strange. People would get the wrong idea. I wasn't, I was getting hot because the heater's on anyway. Hi. How are you? Good to see everybody here tonight. Uh, thank you for joining us. And again, I will put all those links in the description. You've got to read this article. Can you believe this woman? I mean, really? Oh, yeah. Just, you know, develops all these new great investigative things. And she wins all these awards and does a podcast and writes the music for it. And like I said, I have a great day. I would say my accomplishments, if I can get the dishes done and sew a button, I think I need a trophy you know. So anyway, a little bit later on, we're going to have the L mom on. We're going to be talking about the Delphi, not the Delphi, excuse me, the uh, uh, Vallow Daybell case. But now let's turn to Delphi. Okay. Uh, there's just been some wild stuff going around about Delphi. I'm going to play for you. It's about a minute 20. Uh, and it is from, hang on here, I will tell you, this is from WTHR channel 13. And I have to stop it in the middle and say something so I don't get a warning from YouTube. Okay. But listen carefully. This is going to explain the latest that's going on in the murders of Abby and Libby and the new man that everybody is focused on. Yes. Mr. Wonderful. Oh God. He is a disgusting human being. Uh, Keegan Klein. Okay, so here we go. Let's, oh, I guess, hold on. I need to do this properly. I need to do this properly. Let me, uh, sorry, guys. Don't try this at home. This is extremely technical what I'm doing. Okay, here we go. Oh, gosh, that doesn't have a doodad on it. This one does, okay. You know, a doodad. Okay, let me get the sharing thingamabob up here. Share, share screen. And go to Chrome and go here. And everybody, listen carefully, please. Keegan Klein, as part of the investigation into the Delphi murders, court records revealed Klein is the creator of the fake social media profile, Anthony Schatz. It's been a week since Indiana State Police first told us they were looking for more information into that profile. Now the Carroll County Sheriff tells us they've gotten about 500 temps since. State Police also acknowledged today that a secondary investigation from information received during the Delphi investigation led them to Klein. You may remember they first learned about him in 2017, but police didn't arrest Klein on child porn charges until 2020. So Indiana State Police acknowledged that time gap today, but didn't go into explaining why it happened any further. They did say this in a quote, we do not believe that any person has done anything intentionally wrong, but we will continue to critically evaluate our efforts. Yeah, okay, let me just stop it right there. <clears throat> this guy should never have even been out. I mean, he's just a incredible creep and and again we are left with pretty much nothing and uh nothing to to hold on to all of a sudden we just have to be we have to assume which they just said that somehow his name came up in the uh investigation into abby and libby does that mean they think he did anything does he look like bridge guy i don't think so but let me uh, let me finish now. Hopefully YouTube now won't slap me 
slap my hands after I play the rest of this. There's still a lot we here at 13 News don't know about this investigation, and we need to be clear, police have never said Klein is a person of interest in the Delphi murders investigation. State police did release a statement as well, saying we know there is enormous interest in the why of everything we do, but we cannot and will not speculate. One day you will have the opportunity to see and know what we do, and we look forward to that day. For the first time. Uh oh. Okay. Anyway, could you hear me the when I interrupted the um, interrupted the video, or was I uh, muted? Uh, Patty L. This man has they they have not said that this dude has anything to do with Abby and Libby's murder. Not at all. Uh, they have not given any indication of that. Just somehow he. You know, he was trying to lure uh, young girls to him, which is why he had the picture of the model up there. And they were sending him pictures, thinking they were sending pictures of, you know, their bodies to this this very handsome man, when in reality, it was Keegan. And uh, he's a very disturbed individual, in my opinion. But uh, we don't know. It, somehow, his name came up. And they needed to know if anybody else had had any dealings with him uh, on social media or the Internet. We don't know why it took a couple of years, three years to figure it out uh, or four years, whatever. I mean, it's. So the police are not giving out any information. Um, they're not telling us updates or anything. And I just want to ask if maybe there is somebody from the Indiana State Police or somebody in the investigation, perhaps accidentally watching this live stream, I want to ask you, how's that working for you? Hmm? How's that working for you? Keeping everything so close and not letting anybody know anything, not letting anybody try and help you, not giving out a little something that maybe people with incredible skills and and lots of free time can help you with. How is that working, holding it that close to you? Is it working good? Are you getting lots of leads? Are you close? No. Don't even get me started. I think I did get started, didn't I? I do apologize. Um, ABD, if I am not mistaken, and if I am, I will correct myself. I believe it has been said that there was DNA at the scene. What kind of DNA, we don't know. We don't know how the girls were found. We don't know if there was uh, staging there. We don't know anything. Sorry, I have to do this or it'll drive me nuts. There we go, okay. Uh, what are y'all thinking? Let's see. Hold on here just a minute, everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Marilyn Landis, we don't know how this guy is connected other than the police, while they were investigating uh, something to do with Delphi, this man's name came up. We have no idea if he was connected to Abby or Libby. We can maybe assume that there was some sort of connection. Maybe it wasn't a direct connection. Maybe it was a friend of Abby and Libby's that had communicated with this man. And they thought, well, let's be safe and check him out. You know, it was a friend of, Ab I'm, again, I'm just, uh, what if? Okay, I have no information on this. It's just a theory, a maybe. What if one of Abby or Libby's friends happened to be one of the young girls that sent this person pictures. And so they thought, well, you know, there is a connection there. Let's just look at it. Is, it connect is this guy connected to Abby and Libby? We don't know. We don't know for sure. We just know his name came up and that's it because they don't tell us anything. And you know what? That is not working. 
it's not working. Like in the Missy Beavers case, like in this case and so many other cases where it, it's just nothing is happening. And it's because law enforcement just, I don't know why they think this will work. You know, it's like, well, we want to be careful. We don't want to give anything away and, you know, have it be screwed up. Well, so you just leave it unsolved. Come on, think outside the box, do something. Okay. Websleuths.com, tightly moderated, tens of thousands of members with brilliant minds sitting there just waiting. Give them a little piece of evidence that they can dig into for you and help you. You know, think outside the box. <sighs> okay, I'm calming down. You're right, I hate chocolate. Don't put off tomorrow what you can do today, except for me. That does not apply to me, ever. <laughs> Sorry. Insightful one, we don't know. We don't, here's the thing. We don't know if Bridge Guy is the killer. We're assuming he is, because uh, that was just too damn creepy. And I think that's a very safe assumption, assumption but we don't know. I, I just, I wish law enforcement would reach out more. That's all I'm saying. It doesn't need to be web sleuths. I mean, I'm just biased because I because I know what web sleuths can do. And we're sitting here uh, just, you know, waiting for them. And uh, I know what they can do. When I say I know what we can do, let me clarify that. I know what our members can do. I just sit back and go, good job, good job. And our mods make sure that everybody that discusses crime discusses the crime, they don't turn into wackadoodles and going around screaming at people and making up stories and getting crazy. We keep everybody as adult and on topic as possible. We are not close to perfect, but damn, our mods do a great job on websleuths.com. So anyway. Let's see here. You're right, red like wine again. Uh, Libby listened to her gut and took a picture of that guy and had her phone on. And, and that's just it. Why not release more? Why not release more of the man talking? That, to me, would be a great help. Now, perhaps they can't. Maybe there isn't any more. Maybe what is left is too graphic. Understandable. But if not, then release it release it. Let people hear that voice because that down the hill, down the hill, hey guys, down the hill. No, that, that's not enough. Let's, let's hear him talk. Okay. Let's hear him talk. Now, could this uh, perverted butterball turkey of a human being, Keegan, what's his face, be bridge guy? Well, you know, it was in 2017 and uh, maybe he gained a lot of weight between now and then. Could be. I think Bridge Guy looks older, but I don't know. I just don't know. So, yes, Lily and Gail, we need more. We need a lot more. Oh, you're talking about Rodney Alcala. Well, it worked. <laughs> um, also, El Mom is coming on a little bit later, and I forgot to send El Mom the link to the show. So I'm going to do that. Talk amongst yourselves here for just a moment, please. And let me get the proper link. Hold on. And uh, I've had a lot of people ask me about Amy from True Crime Sushi. She's doing great. She's fine. She's just real busy. And she will be back doing her live stream at some point. You know, but real life, unfortunately, does take over at times, especially this time of year. It can get really, really crazy. So let's see. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Link. Okay. And let me just let her know.
talk amongst yourselves. I'm just getting Jen ready here, okay? Okay, and then I have to go down, I have to go turn my heat down. It is, I've got it turned up really high. So hang on, I'll be right back. Do we, is a is the breathing web sluice blanket here? Yes, he is. Hold on. Where is he? There he is. There's part of him. Hang on, I'm gonna go turn down my uh, my heater. I shall return. All ready for Christmas? I hope so. Uh, Saturday night is uh, December 18th, I believe. Is that correct? And uh, I will be doing a True Crime Tales with Trisha. But uh, the next night on Sunday, the 19th, that's my birthday. I'm not going to be doing a show then. But I do have a special request. So join us on Saturday uh, for my birthday. Okay. And I will tell you about it on Saturday. Um, so if you can, that would be great. Okay. I don't want a thing personally at all. No, 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 no. I'm too old. I'm just, I can't believe I'm going to be 63. How did that happen? How in the world did that happen? Um, how about in 10 minutes. Is that enough time? Is 10 minutes enough time, Jen? Okay. Very good. Okay. By the way, I got to give a shout out to Gray Hughes. You need to uh, watch his show from last night because he it, it was it was great. I loved it. He really went off on, uh, you know, people basically claiming they have inside info and uh, on the Delphi case. And, you know, they're they know more than than we do. And yeah, he just went absolutely bonkers. I loved it. Loved every minute of it. It was fantastic. In fact, I'm going to find that link and put it in chat right now. So hang on while Jen gets ready. And da 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 dee 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 dee. There we go. Mm dee 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 dee. There we go. Stop and share. Okay. Uh, if you get a chance, if you haven't, after this show tonight, listen to that. Just, I mean, the first 10 minutes, great. It's really great. Oh, Kathy Wright, I hear you. I don't know. Uh, uh, yes, Lillian Gale. And happy belated birthday to Lillian, December 4th. You're 72. You act like you are a teenager, my dear. I know Robin, Robin Lace is gray, went off on people. I don't believe that. Yes, it was shocking. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn Levy. Patty L. in California. Are you talking about Saturday? Uh, when you say what time in California? 
well, just in case, uh, Saturday's show will be, let's see, uh, it'll be 7 p.m. in uh, in Pacific time. That's Saturday. And the tale we're going to tell has to do with lobsters. Well, one lobster. Very, uh, very inappropriate in these day and ages to, to refer to people like that. But this is about a, ga- a guy named Lobster Boy. And Lobster Boy was an a-hole deluxe, and he was murdered. We'll tell you all about that on Saturday night with Trisha's, not Trisha's, it's True Crime Tales with Trisha. There we go. We'll get it right here. Insightful One, you could be right. Insightful One says, I've always wondered if the girls were already recording and bridge guys showed up. My daughter records herself walking all the time. And that could be, especially this day and age, you know, they record themselves dancing and doing weird stuff for TikTok or just their friends. And they could have already been co- uh, recording. You're absolutely right. No question. Coco and Toast, December 9th. Happy belated birthday. Wait, is Insightful One, is, are you a December person too? Insightful One, happy belated, ah, December 11th, happy birthday. My goodness. So many people are Sagittarians. Oh, thank you, uh, Betty Smith. She says, on Gray Hughes' YouTube channel, he ran a press, press conference with an LE saying, they have more audio video that wasn't released and maybe they can't release it because of what it contains. Understandable. But if they can, they should. I don't. They, I'm sure there's plenty to withhold to make sure you get the right guy and not somebody giving a false confession. Okay. But put something out there that people can look at. That's not enough. Obviously not enough because he hasn't been found yet. So, oh, so frustrating. And you know what? I hope they solve this. I hope they solve Abby and Libby. Obviously, we all do. But, you know, if they solve it 20 years from now, you know, they're just saying they're going to pat themselves on the back and say, yeah, well, we had patience and, you know, we, we got it. Well, guess what? You know? Give the people a little more information, and I bet you can solve it sooner. I don't understand this withholding of so much information that people can't help. Okay, it's the 21st century. We're going to drag law enforcement into the 21st century, kicking and screaming. And I have a one fruit fly. It's been living here for about 10 years. I'm going to get it, and it keeps flying in front of me. Um, I just... I don't, I don't understand it. I get withholding evidence for a while. It's obviously not working. It's just not. I really hope, I really hope, I can't imagine that this is the case. But I really hope it isn't we're withholding it because they don't. What if somebody stepped forward and solved it immediately? Would that be a problem if they released more information and somebody went, oh, yeah, him. Like with the T-shirt on Web Sleuths. And I'm going to have to tell this story again because I have a different point here. Um, The detective in Nevada 23 years they've been trying to find out where this particular t-shirt was made because it was on the body of a murder victim that was unidentified and the the detective called me and says i'm turning this over to you also going to release it to the public but specifically here see what your sleuths can do 23 years they had held on to that t-shirt 
So uh, our WebSUSE members worked on it for about 10 days. They were doing great. And then one of our members came back from vacation. And within 36 hours of looking at that T-shirt picture, she had everything where it was made, when it was made, uh, where the factory is, where the factory is now, who owned it, how much it cost, where it was sold, blah, 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 on and on. I mean, imagine cops working on something for 23 years. And a woman comes back from vacation and in 36 hours, she's got it. She's got it. She had it all. Now, it did not lead to his identity. They were hoping that's what would happen. But the good news is they can check that off. And it's just such a perfect example of what can be done. But because, and here's the thing, here's the other thing. This is my point I was going to make. With all the craziness out there, especially on YouTube with true crime, I don't blame law enforcement for not going to social media at this point. Uh, because there's too many just bad, bad people out there. And I, I just, I hope someday we can get through to them that WebSleuths is not that group. WebSleuths.com, the true crime discussion forum, where it's moderated 24-7. You know, we keep an eye out. We don't let kookiness go on there. Now, we have over 12 million posts and over 200,000 members, so I'm sure... Uh, you know, mistakes have been made. I'm not going to suggest they weren't, but anyway. Okay, let me take a swig of my uh, sparkling Pellegrino. Sparkling natural min mineral water. Zero calories. Okay, how's that? Don't, can you, <clears throat> I can't imagine they're not going to sign me as their spokesperson immediately. <clears throat> I mean, really, what says buy me more than this? Okay, the L mom is here. The L mom has her own YouTube channel and it specializes in discussing the uh, Daybell Vallow case and the uh, ties to the Mormon church or the, let's put it this way, the ideas that Chad and Lori and the rest of the gang took from scriptures and things from old scriptures from the LDS church and the L mom is, I mean, you are the expert in the research and how Lori and Chad, mostly Chad, in my opinion, came up with a lot of this craziness. So, and there's been a lot happening in the case and we haven't seen you for like two weeks. I know. How, how are you? I am good. How are you? I'm good. So what, tell us what you've been working on. Tell us what's new. Just let's just start chatting and see what's going on. Well, as far as the case, you guys are probably more up to date than I am. Um, so I actually, the last really big thing I did was look over the body cam footage of Melanie Pulowski because I actually went down to American Fork to get that footage. That's where the footage oh, really? came from. I was going to put it on my, my channel, but I was so busy with finals. I just handed it off and I'm like, here you go. Wow, <laughs> go crazy with cool. it, guys. Okay, now let's explain. Let's explain that body cam footage because there are so many different, you know, uh, branches of this tree of murder in this family, and this is one of them. This is Lori Vallow Daybell's niece, and she was married to a guy named um, Brandon uh, Boudreau. Well, Boudreau. God, see, I can't get the name straight. I love that Boudreau. name. <laughs> it's a beautiful name, and Brandon was shot at was it in arizona that he was shot mm -hmm. at yeah somebody shot at him and it just happened to be a somebody that was driving a jeep that tylee drove and right. uh it's it's pretty pretty safe to say that it was alex that took a shot at him and so brandon was able to get custody of their kids because melanie didn't did she abandon her kids or is that somebody else no i think she did leave them and then she went back and he yeah, was he, like what the he, you know yeah he got custody of them and so he was actually uh basically hiding out at his parents house and all of a sudden melanie shows up and alex cox is there at the house at his parents house and that's the body cam footage what i mean 
I can only assume that they were there to kill him. Why else would they be there? You know, she says, yeah. oh, I want to get my kid. No, you don't want to get your kids. You Didn't she sneak around the garage and, and you know, go on the property? And yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine yeah. there was any good that was going to come out of her and Alex, you know, the hitman uh, being there. So yeah. what did you t tell us what you thought of the uh, body cam footage? So I looked through all the footage and I thought it was funny because they were like, uh, hey, we told you yesterday not to come back and you're back, mm -hmm. you know, and she pulled the, the Karen card, in my opinion, like she's just like, <laughs> yeah, like Lori. Um, and these guys were just like, no, nah, we're not going to buy that. And they were really patient at first, but at one point, and I was like, oh, there's the non-Mormon guy. <laughs> Cause you know, American fork. Yeah. Um, but where he just finally was like, stop, stop mm -hmm. talking. And he actually like kind of yelled at her and was like, I'm sick of this. Like, we've told you not to come back. You are here. And then she's like, but what about my kids? I don't know if my kids are safe and blah, blah, blah. And he, they're like, well, we'll go check. And Ugh. they come back out. She's like, how do I know? Can you take a picture? I don't know if they're safe. I can't tell. And he's like, so you're going to call us liars. And she's like, blah, blah, blah. God. And he was just what like, if a you lunatic. Think... Yeah. He, he's like, if you think we don't take child safety seriously in Utah. And I was like, well, you guys might, but the judges tend to send them back with their parents. But that's Yeah, that's issue. true. That's very, <laughs> um, very true. But officers and social workers, they do, I think, their best. And they get a, a lot of times when they do take kids mm -hmm. and try and put them in a better situation than judge because of the way the laws are written will send them right, right back. So that's why Terrible. everyone quits. Yeah, <laughs> I don't blame them. I don't blame them. I'm going to put up the uh, part one of this body cam footage in chat right now. Uh, so y'all can see it. It's it's pretty long. But in case, just in case you haven't seen it, it's it's yeah. good to review because it is uh it does show a level of uh of crazy there it's the cox family crazy coming out you know yeah and, oh and uh, she's just uh sorry i interrupted no no go ahead um but i felt like those officers i was like you think, i think they did a pretty good job um mm -hmm. some people i think had some criticism because they said well they you know were too easy on her or um, they were too nice or something. I mean, I, when I, I watched the, all of the footage, like from all angles, cause mm -hmm. I got all my angles and I was like, ah, I don't, I don't think a lot of people are familiar with the way Utah works. Yeah. Um, and that it is more in, informal. It's the same. Uh, I actually read, oh, I did read some of the, um, Mark means documents. Okay, Mark Means is Lori's uh, attorney, and uh, the yeah. prosecution has asked that Mark Means be removed because they basically think he's a, a wackadoodle, is I think yeah. the legal term. So, Yeah, I think they put it a little um, differently, but yeah, I read through the whole Rob Wood transcript, and I found mm -hmm. that to be very interesting. That was something else. That's why I thought of it, because, I, and I don't know what went on before, and I certainly can't speak for idaho i can i can tell you that uh when there was some like concern that did he uh, not conduct himself professionally was he just um like running the the interview mm -hmm. without full disclosure and i felt like i don't feel like that's the case i feel like now, what no, interview? Have, what what interview? This are you is the summer about? one. Sorry. Okay, the um, summer interview. You're, summer and you're interview. talking, and you're talking. A summer is uh, Lori's uh, sister. sister, and yeah. uh, it was uh, the prosecutor in the uh, yeah, in the Daybell case. He was down there interviewing her, and that got Mark Means all in a tizzy. Yeah. Well, they. I didn't know this. Um, Sorry, I'm like, I just shoved a bunch of food down my bullet. So <laughs> that's okay. Um, You're fine. Uh, but so, yeah, so Summer is Lori's sister, and um, 
it's clear by the text messages regarding Lori's husband's murder, mm -hmm. um, Charles Vallow, that she knew more than what it, she was willing to admit. Right. And it sounded to me like it was an informal meeting that she had with Rob Wood, that it was, to me, when I listened to him, I was like, it, it seemed to me like he was like, oh, you know, come on in and we'll kind of talk about. And he was very clear in the beginning and said, well, let me tell you what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, her attorney recorded that. Idaho is like Utah, the one party recording state. Right. So they were able to record that. Mm -hmm. We don't know what happened before the recording began. But um, I read through the I read through that and I was like, I don't really see a lot of concern. People are concerned. Like, did he violate any ethics or anything? I don't think he did. I just think Idaho is kind of like Utah where it's more informal and we don't, right. we don't use salutations and stuff here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, I thought it was interesting. I read through the forensic psychologist report. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, Mark means his friend from like junior high that he called up and was like, hey, could you run this report for me? No, allegedly. <laughs> right. Um, but I thought it was funny because I'm reading through it going, okay, this guy's a forensic psychologist. And mm -hmm. in the very beginning of this interview, Rob Wood makes it clear to Summer, I'm, I'm going to tell you what we're thinking. Right. He did. And then like the forensic psychologist is like he didn't do that and I'm, I'm what I like um so I read those I thought those were interesting mm -hmm. as far as the body cam footage I mean that was all I really noticed of that is just that Melanie was so determined and she did not have custody of her kids there was some question in chat from what I understand Brandon did and still has custody of the children thank God yeah and so. she kept claiming that they were, they had, she had court paperwork. Well, what she had from the sounds of it are, um, and I don't know if this is a case in Arizona and Utah, you have to go through a mediator. Mm -hmm. And uh, before, if you're getting divorced with kids, like that's mandatory. And so you'll get these agreement papers, but they're not signed by a judge. And that's what it sounded to me like it was, where they right. just had like this, it hadn't gone all the way through the court system and she was mm -hmm. trying to tell these officers like this is a court document i'm like oh, i know well, I mean well, she, she was eventually arrested and charged yeah. with, was it trespassing no it was a domestic violence wasn't it yeah it did yeah. do domestic violence i can't remember why they told her they were going to charge for that i think because she crossed into instead of just the yard she crossed into the garage or something she went to and the so garage point, and start looking around i mean telling you there with alex there there was something was going to happen and it was going to be ugly because they thought again they thought they had god on their side that's what they're thinking and that's what chad mm -hmm. is thinking with all of these deaths everybody they think they're doing the right thing and god is telling them that this is okay to do uh, it's just amazing yeah. to me how they think that god is you know their god is okay with murder especially well, how young children how crappy is that to do to your kids? Your kids are yeah. inside watching movie, chilling out. They're already going through a divorce. Mm -hmm. They're already young and they don't quite know, right? Like, even though their mom is, uh, eat, whew, yeah, um, they still don't know. It's still their mom. It's their mom and, then, and they love her. Yeah. What were you going to do? Just barge in there, shut Probably. up the place and grab the kids? I, I mean, it's wouldn't, so... would that surprise you at all? Wouldn't surprise me one single bit. No, it's so it. awful. It's like... Yeah, it is so awful. Um, and uh, I hope when those kids get older that they have nothing to do with that family because the Cox family, other than Adam, who is the normal brother, uh, they're all toxic, horrible. You know, they've, they've stood by Lori. They said she was a great mother. I, I just don't... I'm getting started again, Jen. I'm going to get started. I, I know. Never I'm going to end. watching going, this is usually my job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But I just, oh my God, it makes me, it just makes me crazy. And then to think that we're going to wait till 2023. And even then, I'll be surprised if it happens in January of 2023. You know, I'm sure they're hoping that Lori uh, will uh, depart the crazy train and be well enough to be charged. But I don't know if she... 
I don't know if that'll ever happen. I just don't know. You know, I don't feel confident over it. And I think yeah. that that's a, a major yeah, I uh, problem when you have, when you don't have an insanity plea. What is it like Utah, Idaho? Well, there's like four states. Idaho. Right? Well, Utah does have, I think it has an insanity plea, but I'm not, I'm not sure. And thank you, uh, Lynette, is it uh, Bevern's? And thank you so much for the super chat. She says, for having two of the grooviest, groovy chicks mm -hmm. on the screen at once, big smooches to you both thank you hey we gotta oh, put that up here because yeah. i haven't been That's called a groovy sweet. chick since i was at the cottonwood club and 11 years old oh the Cottonwood club yeah and the guy a guy wanted to to take me horseback riding i said i was a groovy chick so thank you lynette thank you very oh lynette burns sorry and uh, on my uh phone here it was all cut off so i couldn't read it the y was cut off so i can't read it right now because like I've hit that age where I kind of need readers, but I don't want them. I know. I hear you. So, so anyway, what uh, do you have anything coming up that you would like to uh, to talk about? A anything going on with Crusha? Crusha is uh, Charles Vallow's niece and uh, Kay Woodcock's daughter. And you and Crusha do a lot of uh, YouTube together. Anything coming up with you guys in the near future? I think we're gonna, we're trying to keep it over on her channel. We did do a live yesterday. We made it on my channel because we had flipping Apple, like our notifications were off. So I thought she was silencing mine and she <laughs> thought I was silencing her. So we were both like, what the heck? Oh my gosh. Um, and so I didn't hear from her. So I just scheduled it on my channel. Cause I'm like, well, I've been gone for a couple weeks and I don't want to like keep putting it off. Um, but we really want to keep it over on her channel because she can do the super chats and stuff. And I don't have any interest in that, um, okay. right now, um, because so, I'm a commitment phobe. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's okay. We, we love you for it. So, um, so what is going on? Anything, so, uh, anything exciting? So that'll be Sunday at seven. I mean, we just really, those are more relaxed. Mm -hmm. I know people kind of get frustrated sometimes because they're more, uh, like, you know, it's just we talk about the case or we talk about other things. Um, they're more like kind of a loose conversation format. Mm -hmm. um, on my channel, I am trying to get back into. Um, uh, I got to go through an editorial and like try and plan and decide what videos I want to do next. But I happen to have an interesting situation Friday um, because I can't like not step in dog turd like at every corner well that's but, part of your job are you able to, yeah. i have no idea what it is but are you able to talk about it yeah so um i made i made a group uh a little mad oh uh, what a shock what a surprise yeah i know uh they're extremists and i have been researching this group actually for a really long time i've been researching um this type of movement and it's similar to the movement of chad and Lori and that mm -hmm. whole movement but this is a more militant um more alt-right uh type of movement and it's, and it's religious is it an offshoot of the lds okay yeah I, I wouldn't call it an offshoot because it's more of like a loose network what what they do is they use hashtags and they're more like a like a group like a chat group i don't know you guys on facebook you have your little uh, so they, they just they they gather and they have a certain thought and it's <clears throat> extremely hardcore is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean they mm -hmm. do, they do the same thing though. They go into the deeper doctrines, the older stuff. They go into a lot of the like gloom and doom type of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, they are very anti LGBT plus, and uh, that uh, uh, that's part of the reason they don't like me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Um, yeah, it made them mad. And so I actually, I still have to call the police department because, oh, that um, bad? yeah, like they're, uh, I had to shut down my social media. So if you accidentally got deleted, that's not my intention. <laughs> I just, oh, I have to like so shut it down. That is um, ridiculous. I hope the police take you seriously because they didn't mean when I had to report somebody at all. So yeah. uh, I hope they do take you seriously. Do you, I mean, yeah. you have, have you reported them yet? Um, no, and the problem is with this group in particular is they do a lot of like, oh, we weren't serious. That meme where we 
show a sword going through like the heart of an LGBT plus person, that's a joke. You know, like, um, so I, I have a ton of documentation. Mm -hmm. I, as soon as it started, I was like, I started to shut things down and take screenshots and um, try and get as much as I could while I could. And so right. I did get um, a, enough information. I don't know if the police will take it seriously. I don't know what they can do. I just would not like to get swatted. And so that's like, um, that, yeah, exactly. I hear you. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I, I think I'm still gonna work on that, though. I mean, I've already poked the bear. Why not? Yeah. Like, well, I've already pissed them off. Um, but it should I, be really interesting. I support you 100%. You let me know whatever you need these. You know, I've been, I've been through this before. And yeah. um, I'm sure I'll go through it again. But it's scary. Every time it's scary, especially when you have family. So please be careful. Yeah. Take it very seriously. Don't blow anything off. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I told like everyone in the live yesterday, I'm like, I just had my car $900 worth of work. It's good to go. It's been checked out. If my brakes go out, that's not me. Like, <laughs> right. right. Everyone just know. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not, I, I'm stable. I'm not thinking of doing anything. Um, but I'm more, I'm always worried about my family and I sure. try and keep everything at, as private as possible, but you, you can't keep everything I mean, you just, if someone wants to find you, they're going to find you. Well, that's true. Um, just be careful. If it comes, just... Yeah. Like, you know, if it happens, I mean, we've got security. We live close to the police department. We've mm -hmm. got um, a, a thing that I never, ever wanted until I started YouTube. And then I'm like, maybe it's okay to get me. What, um, what thing would this be? Or can we not the, say? Oh, the thing that goes, that goes boom. Kaboom, yeah. kaboom. Yeah. Whew, whew, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, that's someone else's job. And be like, you. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's just too bad, but it is a scary trend going on in the church. I think it does. In fact, I did find some connections today to the whole crowd that, um, preparing a people type of crowd. Like, I found where some of these people were talking about the teachings of. Um, Rob Meldrum and um, I always want to call him Mark and Margie James and that's not their name. Like, I knew a Mark and Margie, that's why, but mm -hmm. um, I, the I James. I don't, don't know who that um, is. They're the preparing of people. They, they are the people, like they owned that company, that media okay. company. Mm -hmm. So everyone, you know, in the beginning they thought preparing of people was just like this cult and it's not. It really is just a media company. It's mm -hmm. um, Again, that loose kind of all those people, not playgroup is right, right. Kind of what I call them. Um, and I saw some connections there that I was like, oh, okay, all right. So we're also going militant mm -hmm. here, guys. Um, and that's well, that's hard as someone that was Mormon. And I always say this: this is it's not easy for me just because I'm no longer a member of the church to mm -hmm. see what's happening. It's yeah. very hard, actually, on me. Um, right. So, yeah, that's pretty much, pretty much it. Well, just stay safe, my dear. And again, anything you need, I, I'll do whatever you need. Okay, if you need a platform yeah. to talk, come on over. <laughs> go okay. And be like, yeah, so. I have to go watch Greg Hughes. Greg oh yeah, Hughes. Greg Hughes. I call him Greg because there's a a politician in Utah named Greg Hughes. Oh, there is, isn't there? That's right. Yeah, but Gray is nothing like Gray. No, no. Yeah, go check out his show from last night, his live stream from last night. It, it's great. And really quickly, uh, Garden Girl Nancy said, yes, defense can plead insanity in Utah, but only if they couldn't develop the intent to commit the crime. In other words, they're so crazy, they don't even realize that what yeah. they're doing is this is a crime. So, yeah, it's a, it's a very high bar in Utah for sure. El mom, just take care of yourself. We're here for you, my dear. Okay. Yeah, you take care of yourself. Oh, so. I'm fine. I've got Scrappy Joe. I know one's gonna get me. Oh, so. oh yeah. He's, yeah. He's I get, what's he doing? Sleeping over there? Um, well, let's see here. Let's see if you can see him. Um, there he is. There he is. There's my yeah. boy. He's yeah. super he, ferocious. He looks I'm like he's worried. sleeping, but he's just getting ready to attack. Is he? Yeah. That's like a secret. Yeah, that's his secret way. <laughs> Cujo. 
<laughs> he is Cujo. Okay, my dear. Uh, we'll talk to you All next right. Monday, okay? Yes. Yeah. Give, Stay give safe. Crush, give Crush our love, okay? I will. Okay. All bye bye. Right. Bye bye. Okay. Okay. Um, I have to explain something that was in chat because we have a lot of new members here. And I mentioned that I was called a groovy chick when I was 11 years old at a place called the Cottonwood Club in Salt Lake City by this guy that I can't remember if he wanted me to go play tennis or horseback riding something. And then um, I think it was Red Like Wine again, put up this thing that said, oh, about the same time where you told people to put your pole in Trisha's hole. Actually, no, that happened quite a bit earlier. I was very young when that happened. And let me explain. It's very innocent. I don't know what you're thinking, but it's a very innocent story. Uh, my father and his uh, family, they all bought little plots of land along the Weber River and put little cabins on it. And so every weekend in the summer, we'd go up and go fishing. And there was this great fishing hole made by a flood. Uh, the, the river flooded and a big tree fell and it created this great fish. I mean, it was the best fishing hole. And I'd go off fishing alone when I was six or seven. And, you know, I had my little license and, you know, my little creel and my little Zebco. And you'd always see, you know, my dad would always see fishermen going up and down the river. And they'd give each other tips on where they're biting and all friendly. So I'm doing the same thing, right? And um, I decided to name this beautiful fishing hole Trisha's Hole. And uh, stop it, just stop it. And, of course, what is the thing you should do in Trisha's Hole? Well, you should put your pole in Trisha's hole. And I thought that's lovely. It rhymes. And so I would give that tip to fishermen as they walked along the river. Where I don't know what you're thinking. It was a lovely, beautiful little kid thing to do until my brother made me stop. So, yes, that was way before uh, uh, when I was called a groovy chick. Yeah, that was much later in life. <laughs> so that's what that is. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My my grandma in England, she's a weirdy, isn't she? That's what she said to my mom. <laughs> I'd gone over there. I'd met her before. I'd gone over there when I was like eight. And uh, this time I was, oh, I don't know, uh, 13 or 14, maybe 13, 12, 13. And I was laying on my grandmother's bed sleeping because jet lag was awful. And so my mom and my grandmother thought I was asleep. And my mom was just talking about me. And my grandma, I could see her. I kind of peeked out and I could see her. And she looks at me and she goes, oh, she's a weirdy, isn't she? <laughs> oh, I wear that with pride. Okay. Anyway, yes, well, now you know exactly. Hi, Alicia Gallegos, good to see you. Coffee with Connie, glad you're here. Yes, Lillian Gale, I had to explain that. Tia Bennett, hi there. Betty Smith, I hate chocolate. Hello, darling. Sharon H., Shiva's girl, antique boutique. Algo, it is great to see you. Twins, mom, 2011. Marilyn Landis, Julia Marshall. Julie Marshall, sorry. Candy Williams, insightful one. PJ, Linda Petrovich. And uh, let's see, Sharon H., Terry Queer, PJ, I said PJ. Anyway, Cynthia W., and the gang is all here. Jenny Ree, glad you made it. And thank you to, is Ping here? I didn't see Ping here tonight. Uh, insightful One is here. Thank you, Insightful One, for keeping the, uh, the lid on the wild ones out there. Peekaboo Cockatiel, hi, darling. Good to see you. Uh, and let's see. Stephanie B, Red Like Wine again, Hannah Bell. Yeah, she's a weirdy. I love that. Oh, Ping was here. Okay, great. And um, Love and Coco, thank you so much to our wonderful moderators. And we'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place. Uh, we may have a guest, we may not. We just may sit back and chat. I don't know. On behalf of Ping the Router Fighting Fish, who made an appearance earlier. I can't do this because of the camera. He was out and Scrappy Joe and Boo and Lilith. Thank you all. Thank you for everything. Thank you for your support, for your kind words. And I really appreciate you all. Okay. Take care. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.
Bye-bye.